Um, today, I'm really excited to uh, have uh, Zubair Rashad uh, defend. So he's been uh, in the lab since I think 2019 uh, in mechanical engineering, doing a lot of amazing um, work on 3D robotics perception uh, using inductive priors. Um, so just to uh, preface the administrative part, we'll have uh, Zubair talk for about uh, 45 to 50 minutes and then um, I, you can ask questions, but maybe keep it to clarification questions if possible. Um, and then we'll have a public questioning session. Uh, and then after that, we'll ask everyone to leave and have a, a private session as well. Uh, so with that, uh, take it off, Zubair. Yeah, thanks, Al. So Hi, everyone again. So I am Muhammad Zubair Shad, and the title of my thesis defense talk is Learning 3D Robotics Perception Using Inductive Priors. The recent advances in deep learning have led to a data-centric intelligence in the last decade, that is artificially intelligent models unlocking the potential to ingest a large amount of data and be really good at performing digital tasks such as text-to-image generation, machine-human conversation, as well as image recognition. So let's consider the supervised learning problem where um, it is simply defined as a digital brain or a neural network app parameterized by some weights theta, and that it really ingests a large amount of data, potentially on the orders of billions or even trillions of tokens for models like ChatGPT, and outputs either a deterministic or a generative data of some form, which could be images, text, or class labels with masks. Now, as opposed to this fully data-dependent pipeline, um, this thesis really covers the topic of learning with structured inductive bias and priors to design approaches and algorithms unlocking the potential of principle-centric intelligence. So more specifically, we will use the same learning paradigm as above, which is a supervised learning paradigm, but rather we would be studying key changes to either the input view as the neural network or its underlying architecture, as you can see in the middle, or the weights of the neural network, as you can see on the right. So we would consider these prior knowledge, which would really help the neural network learn like very, very fast or learn better. So the main motivation to using these priors is that the real world offers a lot of these priors, which the agent do not need to learn twice. So they can be either universal truths like laws of physics, widely accepted mathematical models of how the world works. Um, and as shown here with multi-view geometry principles, it really defines the correspondences between geometric relationship between two corresponding camera viewpoints so that it constrains the possible correspondences between points in different views. And lastly, they can be heuristic beneficial for the hypothesis space of the problem we are trying to solve. Um, and this is defined by modularity in neural network architectures. So another really good motivation to using priors is that high quality data is really expensive to get. Um, here we can see that 2D data is 100x larger than 3D data sets. Um, and this 2D data is really available on the internet to us, uh, widely available for use to us. But 3D data is highly curated and created by artists with significant efforts. Now, one more uh, really nice example on why we want to use priors is that the output of large scale pre training on this internet scale data is not really useful to us in any sort of form. So, we still need fine tuning on high quality data for models like ChatGPT, which are uh, train on like internet scale data for like millions and millions of dollars. And as Jan said, we need better architectures to learn efficiently. So hence the focus of this thesis is to design algorithms that learn efficiently. Second, learn with data annotation scarcity. And third, show improved generalizability and symptorial transfer. Whereas if we learn without priors, they can demand significantly larger data sets um, they can define annotations such as dense viewpoint annotations uh, for novel view synthesis tasks uh, like NERFs, or they would really struggle, struggle with less efficiency or non-robust models. So here's my thesis statement. Deep learning agents can address the challenges of data and annotation scarcity in the real world through utilizing data from SIM and one by bridging the gap between SIM and real with strong inductive priors in the form of hierarchy, geometry, and structural context, and two, enabling systems to perform a variety of 3D tasks in the real world 
by creating strong 3D representation from unsupervised 2D data. So we'll really be studying fundamental algorithms in this talk that have applications in both robotics graphing, such as manipulation, pose estimation, as well as robotics grasping. Also, we'll be studying another application area, which is autonomous driving, where perception, especially 3D perception part, is really the first key step in solving visual goal navigation, collision avoidance, as well as sensorial. So more specifically, um, the applications that we will see in this talk are 3D object detection, language guided navigation, 3D reconstruction, as well as novel view synthesis. Again, all of these tasks are really the first important steps for autonomous agents to understand the world around us and take actions in this dynamic 3D world. So here's the structure of my talk today. First, we will be discussing two key words for thrust one, which is perception for 3D object understanding, with a major aim of exploring synthetic data prior for generalization. We will then move to vision and language for action thread and explore hierarchy prior for agent-centric deep learning systems. And lastly, we will discuss the efficient 3D scene understanding work. And so prior knowledge have been used in a lot of these uh, scenarios, but, but as I highlighted earlier, the focus of this thesis would be on efficiency and especially for end-to-end -end systems in the first work, for modularity, for improved generalizable systems in the second work, and for robustness of feature representations for important 3D tasks in the third work. More specifically, we will see how we can modify the traditional supervised learning paradigm, as we saw earlier, uh, the big equation, and incorporate key changes to either the input network weights, the additional input of the neural network, as well as um, either the network architecture, all while using key prior knowledge of how the world works. Let's quickly recap some of the preliminaries we'll, saw, we'll, we'll see in the talk throughout. First, when we say generalizable systems, we want to train on some data and test out, out on completely unseen holdout data, as you can see by the example on the right. We want to deploy our systems in the real world, so we first train on synthetic data and a, or a mix of synthetic or real-world uh, scenes and test out on real-world data with some optional fine-tuning. Embodied AI here refers to the agents getting their knowledge through real-world interactions. 3D scenes can be represented implicitly or explicitly as shown here with point clouds, meshes, nerve, um, or neural fields. And lastly, whenever we will refer to self-supervised learning, we will refer to training without labels and test the neural network on other downstream, either 2D or 3D tasks. Let's move to the first thread, which is efficient object-centric neural 3D representations. Where in both works, we will study prior knowledge from synthetic pre-trainings of 3D shapes as well as appearance, and we'll see how the network weights would be updated uh, based on the prior knowledge. Now, for autonomous systems, the first step is really understanding the 3D world around us, and this is the actual task we'll be solving in the first work, which is joint shape, pose, and appearance prediction from single view RGB observation. Now we call this category level 3D object understanding. Since the, the task really allows us uh, to not have prior CAD models either during training or inference scene. And so, so this is a very challenging task. And here again, we review some of the application that this perception task unlocks, which is robotics grasping, category level manipulation, as well as asset creation. Now, prior works uh, have shown this task before, but they mainly utilize complex multi-stage pipeline for this task. As shown here, these approaches independently apply specifically two stages for this task, uh, one for performing 2D detection and another for performing shape reconstruction or pose estimation. And this pipeline can be really computationally expensive. Uh, it cannot be scalable and has low performance on real-world novel object instances primarily due to their inability to express explicit representation of shape variations within a category. As opposed to this, uh, we propose to reconstruct the complete 3D information, that is the 3D shapes, as well as the 60 poles and sizes, in a single shot manner from just a single view RGBD. So here are more specifics of prior methods, which are mainly anchor-based. Um, they have disjoint shape and pose, are super slow to reconstruct and are category specific in nature. 
whereas our method offers an anchor-free solution, um, is end-to-end method and it's category agnostic, which really means that we use a single model for all the categories. To summarize, our major contribution here is that we predict an end-to-end -end method, which is orders of magnitude faster, as you can see here, around 800 times faster than existing works and runs in real time, and we offer the following contribution. How does the proposed method work? Um, the meta method is really divided into four major blocks. First, we learn the spatial per pixel representation of multiple objects at their central locations to this feature pyramid backbone. And this really allows us to learn like these multi-scale resolution features um, where we employ a ResNet 50 FPN backbone to get these features and then add task specific tests, one each for instant heat map prediction as well as um, shape and pose regression. We then design this 3D autoencoder to learn canonical shape codes from a large database of shapes. And this is the actual part where we will be encoding our shape priors in, into the network. And these priors, again, have been shown before, uh, but our major contribution is how we efficiently retrieve them in an end-to-end -end manner. So we represent the complete 3D information um, that is a retrieval of these shape priors in an end-to-end -end network. And essentially, this is the part where every pixel kind of denotes for the most probable shape pose and size code. And finally, we do a joint optimization for detection, reconstruction, as well as 60 pose and size these using supervised losses. So just to zoom into the part where we encode our shape prior into the network, to pre-train this 3D representation, the model is really comprised of an auto-decoder architecture with one lead encodes deeper object, and the same decoder MLP, which makes us really category agnostic um, and really allows us to model multiple instances using a single network. Now, our geometry priors come from pre-training our shape representation on 50 shape net categories and around 50,000 CAD models, and the architecture that we'll be using here is a point net like architecture for encoding shapes and a decoder convolutions for decoding shapes, where essentially the main goal is that we want to reconstruct the original input so that we can have, learn a compactified representation for each object. So here we show, for instance, reconstructions as well as TSNE embeddings of multiple objects, which you can really see that it, it learns a disentangled CD representation for each object class. Again, our method summary is that latent shape priors plus single shot per pixel representation makes us really, really fast in terms of retrieving the actual um, shape prior. So how do we test the network? Here we show the task and the data set itself. Uh, we use NOx synthetic and real data set to evaluate our approach. And we mainly test for shape reconstruction as well as the quality, of, uh, uh, quality and accuracy of detected 60 poles and sizes. Again, the key takeaway here is that we primarily train on synthetic data with minimal real-world fine-tuning, and our priors, are, the 3D priors that we learn from synthetic data are actually the ones that help us generalize from SimTutorial. We benchmark this method on both detection and 60 pose estimation metrics and compare it with strong baselines, and we show that our method improves 60 pose and size estimation on real-world NOx scenes by around 12.5%, as you can see from the top chart, um, when evaluated on 10 degrees, 10 centimeter, and it shows 2.7% improvement on 3D object detection when evaluated on 3D IOU at 50%. So we establish a new state of the art for our pre-training while being 800 times faster, which is orders of magnitude faster than the baselines. And interestingly, our, our method, although it outperforms state of the art approaches, um, which are all category specific in nature, i.e. They, they need a strong 2D prior, such as instance mask, as well as category label for pose estimation, where our method doesn't need any of those levels. So finally, we ablate our network, and this is a very important step in deep learning systems, where we show the effect of input modality, shape training regime, as well as depth auxiliary losses on the network performance. First, um, we really show that uh, mono RGB performs worse than RGBD because the task is 3D in nature, and 2D to 3D is essentially an ill pose problem. Second, we show that shape prediction network also helps boost the pose accuracy, but they are very tightly coupled 3D tasks, and the gradients actually go all the way back um, to the input backbone, and they share the same backbone here. And lastly, 
depth auxiliary losses also help symptorial transfer. Uh, but the key idea here is that we manually inject noise in our synthetic depth so that it uh, sees the depth that it will see from connect sensors or some other sensors in the real world. Um, and we'd force an artifact free depth prediction loss here. Qualitatively, how well does our net network perform? Um, here you can see we can reconstruct or we can uh, show accurate 60 poles and sizes of novel real world scenes never seen during training. Um, and we are very accurate than competing baselines, as you can see here. And for 3D shape reconstruction, we also, you can see um, the accurate reconstruction quality as well as with details. Um, so you can really be, this is really useful for like some tasks like robotics grasping with arbitrary prompts, such as grasping with a mug handle for some downstream tasks. So Sarah's trap is great, uh, but it definitely has a few shortcomings. Uh, first, the estimated shapes don't have textures, which if we, if we go back to this application slide is really important for let's say tasks like instance identification. Second issue with center snap is that it cannot correct itself. So for instance, if your laptop or Merg is really different shape than what you kind of have in the training data set, it would regress to the closest one in your training set and hence be erroneous in our predictions. So which makes us really think about our second incremental thread, which is adding a feedback loop to improve center snap performance. And the goal here is made possible by three components. First, a single shot detection and 3D prediction module that really detects multiple objects based on their center points in a 2D spatial grid. And this part is essentially very similar to center snap, uh, but with a key difference that we also add an appearance and a mask head. Second, we have this implicit joint differentiable database of shape and appearance priors, which is used to embed objects in a unique space and we represent um, shapes as sign distance function and textures as texture fields here. And finally, the novel component of this pipeline, which is a 2D to 3D refinement uh, method, utilizing an octree based course to find differentiable optimization to improve shape post and appearance prediction in inference time iteratively. So a key contribution again is an iterative feedback loop to correct the 3D shape predictions uh, for an end-to-end -end neural network we have an efficient shape extraction method. And finally, we also introduce a texture prior in this multi-object regression task. So let's dive into a couple of parts which are really the most interesting about this architecture. So we learned this shape prior, but now we also include appearance. Um, and our shape representation, again, is essentially an SPF or an implicit field, where we this, this uh, implicit field takes in a position X, Y, Z and outputs a scalar value that is sign distance function to the object surface. For appearance, we use a scalar texture fields which output a three-dimensional RGB uh, for every query point. And again, our architecture is here is like an auto decoder architecture with one latent code Z, each unique for, for one object. So how do we train this network? We minimize this reconstruction loss to train the latent code Z in addition to the MLP weight where we only um, specify textures at the object surface since everywhere else they are ill-defined. Now, a naive way would be to let the end-to-end -end, uh, training objective figure out the decomposition on its own, but, but we really found out through our empirical analysis that it doesn't work really well in this downstream regression task. And essentially, the goal of this differentiable database of shape and texture priors, as you can see here, is um, to basically have a disentangled representation for both shape as well as appearances. So here we show that contrastive losses really help us achieve this disentanglement. And you can see A versus C here, where C is really instrumental for downstream regression tasks uh, based on our empirical analysis, but A uh, doesn't really help us here in, in, in having a really disentangled representation. Now to finally achieve this test time optimization, which is the iterative feedback loop, one of the main novelties of this work, we aim to find this differentiable transformation to extract the object surface encoded in ZSDF. And now our trivial solution would be to simply threshold the points which are more than the SDF uh, value at that certain threshold. However, um, unfortunately for us, this process is non-differentiable with respect to the input latent ZSDF. 
we utilize a very simple mathematical formulation, which is deriving an STF value um, SI with respect to the input coordinates XI, which yields a normal at this point. Um, and this can be computed in a single backward pass. And a very nice visualization of this is shown um, from this paper. Now, another observation or another um, uh, improvement that we see in this work is that extracting the object surface from a pre-trained STF neural network is, is a very brute forcey solution, and it's not uh, very optimal, very, very extremely inefficient. So you can see here, if we start with like around 215,000 points, the points that will actually hit the surface are around six, 1,600, and the actual efficiency is like 0.7%. So thus we propose an octree-based procedure to efficiently extract points here. So we define a coarse voxel grid, and estimate the STF values for each of the points using this pre-trained STF network. We then disregard the voxels whose STF values are larger than the voxel grid size for that resolution level. The remaining voxels are then subdivided, each generating eight new voxels, and we repeat this process until the desired resolution level is achieved. And here we show an example, 3D to 3D optimization procedure for method, where one can really see that we can optimize towards a, neural, uh, a very novel shape with new textures in a very few iterations as possible. And this really shows our net neural network's ability to overfit to a large number of scenes. So how do we test our network? We again measure IOU for detection as well as rotation and translation accuracy for pose estimation. And we show that we can outperform all the baselines, which are again two-stage approaches and we train a single model per category, whereas all the other approaches train like multiple models per category. Now, this is again a very interesting result since our technique doesn't require knowledge of the objects beforehand. Um, it's simply a categorical model, um, whereas other techniques really require segmented object classes or labels beforehand. So hence we achieve a 93% IOU accuracy on synthetic scenes and around 85% IOU accuracy on real world objects, uh, novel object instances, um, where the key takeaway here again is that we establish a new state of the art while also adding textures to the representation. And here we also show um, that we are really com compa uh, comparable in the 3D shape reconstruction metrics as well. And finally, some ablation analysis again, uh, like we saw in the center snap work. Here we show that the impact of octree based differentiable projection where we can see that our representation is significantly more efficient than ordinary object, whereas LOD6 results in the most optimal speed, uh, memory, and reconstruction trade-off. And finally, our iterative optimization is shown on the, for the texture representation is shown on the bottom, where um, this really shows that this iterative feedback loop in a neural network architecture also helps the texture optimization. How well does our network work in real life? Um, this is one of the results on completely in the wild uh, camera capture on an HSR robot, where these instances or backgrounds are never seen during training, which really shows that our method can work for in the wild captures uh, of categorical objects. Here we show more qualitative results of multi-object shape and appearance re reconstruction for real world novel object instances. And these representations, again, are primarily trained on synthetic data with very minimal real-world fine-tuning, which really shows accurate uh, shape and texture reconstruction quality. Okay, so up, up until now, we looked at just static scenes. What about aging-centric deep learning systems, where the neural network itself takes actions in a dynamic 3D world? Which brings us to the second thrust, which is we ask ourselves if we can even design priors um, for these settings, especially for the task of vision and language navigation. And specifically, in the first work, we will see prior knowledge related to the design of neural network architecture itself and how it can result in improved generalizability. So the task we are looking here is slightly different. It is referred to as vision and language navigation, uh, where the agent is really tasked with following a natural language instruction um, in a photorealistic indoor environment without prior access to a map. And the goal location is not specifically provided to us. So the agent must infer it to visual or textual grounding. So for example, given this long piece of instruction, exit the bedroom, go towards the table, 
go to the stairs on the left of the couch, wait on the third step. The agent really has to be spatially aware of its surrounding, let's say the location of the couch and uh, matching it to the instruction, like where the couch is represented in the instruction. And also it has to be temporally conscious of its history of actions. So let's say how far you are away from the goal and stuff like that. So Brian Ruth and VLN have focused on a very simpler subset of this problem by defining this instruction guided robot trajectory as a discrete navigation graph. So it's like just jumping from one viewpoint to the next. And it primarily assumes a lot of information about the task itself. Um, so these assumptions are perfect localization, perfect topology, as well as determining strict navigation from one viewpoint to the next. And hence, one of the contributions for this work is that we lift these agents away from these navigation graphs and propose a more continuous action spaces, which make the problem challenging and closer to the real world. So we're moving away from just discrete action spaces to continuous action spaces. Now to solve this VLAN problem, um, we make use of a very important prior, which is modularity prior, uh, and we make the end-to-end -end systems modular. So essentially breaking down the complex uh, problem into modular, easier to understand problems. And essentially we formulate this novel hierarchical framework for VLAN, which we call Robo VLAN, for effective attention between different input modalities through this modularized training regime. Hence, we tackle this long horizon task with uh, layered decision making. Holistically, our approach comprises of an agent receiving first person visual observations from the environment in the form of RGB and depth, as well as instructions in the form of text. And the agent is really comprised of a high level policy and a corresponding low level policy where the high level policy is really tasked with aligning sort of this relevant instructions with the observed visual cues like how far you are along uh, the goal and uh, which part of the visual instructions corresponding to which part of the text. And finally, the low level policy imitates the feedback controller based on sub goal information and output velocity and steering commands. Now, again, this slide shows our newly proposed continuous formulation for VLN, uh, which really pro closely mirrors the challenges of the real world and compared to this navigation graph based or discrete VLN settings, um, our trajectories are much more complex. Um, they have 4.5x the average number of steps. They have more visual frames, um, hence making this problem uh, close to the real world. So how does our uh, architecture actually work? So the high-level policy is really comprised of this visual spatial reading, reasoning module. Uh, we employ a convolution neural network to find low resolution features for both RGB and depth. We use a pre-trained bird to extract language features. And furthermore, we use a customized transformer module to find this alignment between both vision and text modalities. And this policy really uses an RNN to output high level actions, which is turn left, turn right, go straight or stop. And finally, we use an imitation learning policy for the low level module, which is at each time step T, we basically predict um, low level actions using the sub-goal output from the high-level policy, and the low-level actions are really comprised of linear and angular velocities. How do we evaluate our approach? We measure success uh, to the goal, as well as success weighted by the path length. And we really introduce a suite of flat baselines in RoboVLN. Um, and as you can clearly see the orange bar here, our proposed approach, which is uses a hierarchical structure to the RoboVLN problem, really outperforms all the baselines, hence achieving a 13% improvement in SPL over the best performing baseline, as well as 10% improvement in success rate. And the key takeaway here is that uh, adding the prior knowledge to the network design really helps us improve, have an improved generalizable system. Here we demonstrate an interesting ablation where among other studies that we perform, we test whether hierarchy is indeed the source of improvement. So we designed this experiment where we essentially flattened out the hierarchical model, but still provided auxiliary sub-goal supervision to this model. And as you can see from the results, uh, our proposed method really beats this hierarchical uh, flatten model, uh, which has the same sub-goal supervision. So the key takeaway here is that even the losses data and the network uh, training type is completely the same and only adding prior knowledge to this uh, network design 
really helps to generalize. So here is one of the qualitative results for our method where you can see this complex long instruction where it exits the laundry room into the hallway and turn left and all the way like stop at the doorway where the agent does a reasonable job in uh, stopping three meters away from the goal. Whereas baseline agents, you can see kind of struggles at this task where they can uh, be stuck at the local optima or, you know, vendor around. So we looked at uh, changing one of the parts of the, the network, which is changing the architecture itself. Next, we asked ourselves, uh, can we change the input to the network so that it is more meaningful than just raw RGB observation? So essentially adding a more meaningful output to our network using this prior knowledge. So one hypothesis that we'll be studying in this work is the impact of structured scene memory for complex long horizon VLN setting because we believe this longer horizon VLN task demands spatial, elaborate spatial reasoning to more closely mimic or learn a VLN policy. Now our approach here really combines a classical semantic mapping technique with the learning based method and really equips the agent with the following key abilities. First, we establish the semantic temporal memory by generating this local top-down semantic map from first-person visual observation, which is RGB in depth. Second, we create a spatial relationship between contrasting vision-based mapping as well as uh, linguistic modality. Hence, we really identify the relevant areas now, uh, not in the RGB, but now in the semantic map, which corresponds to the part of the instructions and through a transformer model, and finally, we also preserve the re relevant temporal information through time, which is the last block here, which predicts the actual actions. So the, again, the key contribution here is the knowledge, knowledge distillation, such as semantic mapping in an end-to-end -end system uh, really improves generalizability of these systems. Our architecture is really divided into four uh, sort of multiple stages. First, we use a transformer module to get embeddings for each words in the sentence and really use position encodings, which is used to encode the relative position of the words appearing in the sentence. The output representation of the semantic map is really a map, which is 2R by 2R, center on the agent, and we refer to this map representation as bag of semantic indices, where, where the agent really carries this bag as it moves around in the environment. And to encode this, these uh, map-related features and align them with the RGB uh, language features, we really designed this fully attentive transformer module where the relative position encoding matrix P is used as a Gaussian kernel center, center on the agent with a scale factor of R. And finally, we perform a late fusion of cross-modal semantic map features and RGBD features to predict actions, uh, which are just discrete actions at this point, using a temporal transformer block, where the transformer block is a very shallow four-layer transformer module. So how do we test our approach? Again, we measure success weighted by path length. Now one can really see the impact of semantic map attention in this architecture uh, on all the architectures that we studied. And so one key contribution here is that we can use semantic map attention as a plug and play module with all the baseline architectures but our cross-modal attention transformer still achieved the state-of-the-art results, where you can see that we achieved 13% relative SPL improvement in previously unseen environment using our approach. But if we add semantic map attention to prior SOTA approaches, it also achieves 12% 12, uh, 12 improvement. Here is one of the uh, qualitative results of our method, where you can see that the agent really takes um, decent number of steps around 37 and around 60 steps in the last part to really achieve, uh, to go to the goal location while hitting all the key milestones. And here the map is only used as visualization. It's not available to the agent at all during training or inference. Up until now, we really looked at object-centric and agent-centric learning systems. Um, next, we ask ourselves, what kind of priors help us move from just object-centric settings to scene-centric settings, which are much more complicated, and we have to capture really high-frequency details to be better at those tasks. So essentially, again, we will see a more meaningful input to our neural network using prior knowledge, which is using epipolar uh, multi-view geometry constraints. 
we look at this uh, very challenging task of sparse use and this is of novel scenes, which is a really uh, demanding, like really strong priors for generalizable learning. And the representation that is learned here really enables us to reason about the surroundings in greater detail and could also be used for multiple other downstream tasks. Now, nerves or neural agents fields have shown tremendous success in this novel view synthesis task. Uh, but one very big issue with nerves is that they have their shortcomings, which is they require dense input views of a scene and are really optimized for a scene. So you have to kind of optimize them for thousands and thousands of scenes if you have more than one scene. As opposed to this, generalizable nerves do exist, but they use local CNN features, um, which really works well within the vicinity of source views and require large source view overlap. So now the key result of our method is that we really work for a 360 degree setting. And we are the first one to show that. Um, and we use both local CNN priors as well as global volumetric priors to achieve that task. So how does our network work? We start with a single RGB image. We encode it using convolutional neural networks. We back project it using some learned depth from a neural network, which is shown as Z here. For computational efficiency, we then project each of the features to each of three triplanes, whereas uh, these triplanes really compactly represent the 3D scene um, in a nice manner. We then query the triplanes from multiple sort of different viewpoints, um, having encoded the source viewpoint. Um, and then we decode the representation using an MLP to enforce a photometric reconstruction law. And again, the key idea here is we use additional inputs to the neural network to make the whole learning problem generalizable. Whereas the main prior knowledge in this task is the multi-view epipolar constraints, uh, and it defines the geometric relationship between two sort of cameras observing the same 3D scene. So it constrains the possible correspondences between those points. Now, as another contribution, we propose uh, this large scale data set to study this few short novel view synthesis task at scale. And the data set is both photorealistic and comes with annotations. As you can see, all of these different annotations to study these very challenging tasks. And the main task here is to study few short novel view synthesis, where you can see that during inference for a completely novel scene, uh, one has only access to one, three, or five source cameras which are shown as red here as red cameras, where the task is to render the scene from all the surrounding viewpoints, which is shown here as green cameras, and they may be like 100 or, or, or depending on the scenario. And this is a very, very challenging task. How well do we do on this task? We show a nerve on the far left really struggling at this task, where uh, pixel nerve, which is a popular generalizable variant of nerve in the middle, um, which it also really struggles at recovering high frequency details, whereas our method really faithfully reconstructs both near and five backgrounds. And note that only five views are available to the input uh, to the network during inference, and all the others are um, rendered during uh, inference by the model. Here we show quantitative results, and again, um, the key takeaway is we achieve state of the art results on the newly proposed data set, significantly outperforming generalizable nerve variants, as well as classical nerve variant, further confirming that our priors, which are multi-view epipolar geometry constraints, also help us at this very challenging task. We looked at one way we can import prior knowledge into 3D scene level settings. Next, we ask ourselves, what kind of priors help us learn strong 3D representations? So essentially, we will see priors related to geometry and structural context from just 2D data to be able to generalize or solve a lot of different 3D tasks in the real world. Now, masked autoencoders have emerged as a very strong way to pre-train vision transformers. They work in a way that they mask certain power patches of an image or a text for models like ChatGPT. Um, and they reconstruct the mass patches over and over again for billions or even trillions of times. Um, and the, the actual representation that is learned is a very strong one, so they can be generalized to a lot of different downstream tasks. Now, one issue with this, uh, this whole learning paradigm is that previous approaches require large amounts of unlabeled domain-specific data. And what do we mean here is that, for instance, on the top 2D MAE, the data requires the 2D images, 
whereas the representation learned is also 2D. For uh, point MAE, which is uh, another work, the data requires is 3D point clouds. The representation learned is also 3D, which makes sense. For voxel MAE, the data requires is LiDAR point clouds, and the representation learned is also 3D. Now, coming back to the slide, high quality 3D data is really, really expensive. And compared to this, 2D data is cheap and widely available on the internet. So we ask ourselves this question, can we use 2D data to build 3D representation learning? And turns out the answer is yes. Our solution to this problem is to train a mask autoencoder from neural gradient field representation. And the key takeaway here is that we don't utilize any 2D, uh, any 3D data at all, while we're still able to improve performance on 3D tasks using NERF as a bridge between 2D and 3D worlds. How does it work? We first create large scale nerves from post 2D data. We mask out random patches of a brain nerve and reconstruct the original patches using photometric opacity and opacity losses. And in doing so, our hypothesis is that the network would learn good semantic and spatial understanding from just post input 2D data. And finally, we fine tune our encoder on downstream 3D tasks. And the tasks we're considering here are 3D object detection, voxel grid super resolution, as well as semantic voxel labeling, which are all very uh, challenging 3D tasks. Now, the key idea here is that both our pre-trained model, as well as the baseline model, receive the exact same architecture, uh, whereas our uh, model's weight are uh, started from a pre-trained backbone, whereas the baseline model's weight are started from scratch, and this is where the priors come into the picture to help solve this 3D task. So how do we train these representations? We first create and render a really high quality multi-view 2D data from four different data sources, collecting 1.7 plus million images and over 3,500 plus scenes. Our data preparation for pre-training is shown here. So we start with a multi-view data. Uh, we recover a very fast instant NGP nerve for each of the scenes. We then convert the trained nerve to an RGB density voxel grid. So essentially converting an implicit representation to an explicit representation. And finally, we pre-train this representation or this explicit output using a transformer module. So we train a single transformer module on all the scenes in an unlabeled manner. And note that all 2D operations in this architecture would be replaced by 3D counterparts. We first start again with a 4D radiance and density grid, and we randomly mask out 75% of the grid while also adding positional encodings as an input to the neural network. We then input all tokens into a SOIN transformer encoder, where through four different stages, each token has gone through shifted window self-attention mechanism to get local and global context. And finally, we decode the original unmasked grid using lightweight decoders. Um, to enforce a mass reconstruction loss for faithful reconstruction of mass patches. So how does it work? The result, that we, the resulting output that we get out of the representation is really interesting. And it really shows that we can learn the semantic and spatial structures of indoor scenes. We show masked input grid to the network in the, in the middle, and we show its reconstructions on the right really shows that we can do a faithful reconstruction of the input patches. We also experimented with different masking strategies and found out that random masking with a high ratio of 75% works really best for us since it really removes data redundancy for the network. So how do we test our network? We really disregard the, uh, the decoder and fine tune the encoder on a lot of downstream tasks. Specifically, we fine tune it on three important downstream tasks for this work. And as we show here, we achieve state-of-the-art results on three important downstream tasks by utilizing only post RGB images as inputs. Now, a very interesting result is our cross data set transfer experiment, which uh, really shows that we don't see any of the scenes from this very challenging scannet data, while we are still able to improve performance on 3D downstream tasks, which really shows that you can train on pretty much different data domain and also get improved performance on another data domain. Now, one really important attribute of this kind of pre-training strategy for this mask autoencoder, it's its ability to get better with more and more unlabeled data. 
And here we show exactly the same. So we show that our representation get better on 3D tasks with more unlabeled 2D data, where on x-axis, we see 25%, 50%, up all the way up to 100%, free training scenes available, and we can see that APD25 consistently goes up. Um, on the right chart, we also show that our representation also significantly get, gets better with high quality input nerves, where uh, we show 20 to 30 uh, PSNR input nerve quality. Um, and on the Y axis, you can really see that AP25 also increases from 40 uh, to 80%. Lastly, we really show that our method also achieves better qualitative results on two important 3D tasks. Um, 3D object detection, as well as semantic 3D voxel labeling. We show here a comparison with the strong baseline where the network architecture or the training regime or the losses all stay the same. And the only difference between our method and this very uh, important baseline, NERF RPN, is that our weights are started from this pre-trained 2D backbone, whereas NERF RPN weights are started from scratch. As a conclusion, we discuss key major thrust. For first, we focus on efficiency, and especially for end-to-end -end systems. For second work, we focused on modularity for improved generalizable systems. And lastly, for the third work, we focused on robustness of features for two important 3D tasks in um, the last work. And we consistently really showed across all the tasks how we can modify the traditional supervised learning paradigm to improve uh, or to incorporate key changes to either the network weights or the neural network architecture or uh, either the input used as a neural network, all while using key prior knowledge of how the world works. Now, I wanna, I wanna spend a couple of minutes on this future works, which is, um, since we really explored neural rendering as a lot of the domains we touched in this work, one really cool extension of it is replacing real to sim pipelines for simulators like for embodied AI with just real to real pipelines, whereas we don't have to solve for the domain gap from sim to real. Um, and this is made possible by really, really fast neural rendering approaches like Gaussian splatting. Another extension is distilling 2D diffusion models or 2D foundation models, again, touching back on uh, the very important 2D and 3D data slide earlier, whereas we can really learn st strong priors using 2D diffusion models and distilling them to 3D, which is a fairly standard or straightforward uh, easy task. It requires much less parameters or maybe just fine tuning, adding a few layers like um, LORA. Now, one more extension uh, to using prior knowledge uh, for self-supervised efficient learning is using key priors like 3D categorical for 3D categorical models, like correspondences, optical flow, or shape similarity. And finally, since our world is dynamic and it's 3D, uh, one extension to all of the works presented in this uh, thesis is to extend them to articulated models in the real world that can also move and be really dynamic. So here are the references for the works which are peer reviewed and accepted um, at, at, or submitted at conferences, which were part of this talk. And here are some of the publications that were not part of this talk. Here are some of the open source efforts that emerged from this talk, and we mainly uh, open sourced almost all of the works uh, that we study here. Um, and lastly, I really want to thank uh, my advisor, Dr. Zul Kira, for really uh, taking a chance on me when I was starting my PhD and really helping me throughout these five years. And I really also want to thank my committee members uh, for helping me really improve my thesis writing and providing feedback for this last year. Um, lastly, I want to really thank all my co-authors for this talk, especially um, Toyota Research Institute, who have been really, uh, who hosted me for three amazing internships, uh, as well as SRI International, and all the wonderful folks whom I learned a lot from my PhD. So with this, I'm going to thank uh, everyone and open the floor for any questions. Awesome. Thank you very much. The awesome talk. Um... Okay, so we can uh, start with the public questions. So I don't know um, if there's any questions there. If if on Zoom there's questions, maybe uh, you can put it in chat or uh, raise your hand. Um, I guess if it's in person, Zubair, maybe uh, repeat the question so that we can hear as well. Sure, yep. 
Cool. Any, I guess let's start with the in-person. Are there any in-person questions? I see you nodding. I assume there's a question. Yeah, there is a question by Yusuf. Um, he asked, and if I understood correctly, if there is a connection between some of the implicit representation that we study and the semantic map work, right? For the VLN task itself. Yeah, um, that, uh, yeah that makes a lot of sense. If I understood this correctly, I think I do have a couple of uh, ways I could answer this. Uh, first of all, I've seen a lot of works that have emerged. So we studied one of the works, which is end-to-end -end systems, but there is a lot of work that emerged where they take action directly on semantic map, which is much, much easier and kind of implicitly encodes the goal location in the semantic map itself, or I would say explicitly more, more explicit than implicit. Uh, but our work is essentially more implicit, whereas we uh, just completely like give it to the neural network to learn these representation itself. Um, but there are, I would say more explicit representation, which I think would be more helpful, um, like really predicting an action on the semantic map itself um, and then leaving the control part to the robust sort of controllers, whereas I would probably maybe not trust like, uh, you know, deep learning to directly take an action, but maybe like robust controllers which have theoretical guarantees to take action, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if I can quickly, uh, so I guess the question is, uh, which data set did I use for NERF MAE? Um, yeah. So uh, we do show, uh, I just want to correct one thing. We do show only results on other domains in indoor scenes. So every evaluation is on indoor. Uh, but to answer your questions, we use uh, four different data sets, which is Front 3D, HyperSim, uh, Habitat, Matterport 3D, as well as ScanNet. So these are all uh, kind of varying like realism as well as synthetic nature of the data set. So two of these data domains are synthetic, whereas uh, two are real. Uh, or like one is actually real to sim and one is like completely real. So, um, and we primarily maintain our representation of three of these, uh, whereas we uh, hold out scan net scenes uh, for our sort of evaluation. Uh, so everything is done in indoor, but it would be really interesting, yeah, maybe as a future work to see whatever representation we learn, can it be really useful for outdoor scenes? I would expect it, it should, but we haven't done that uh, evaluation. Yeah. Um, I guess like the question is that I'm going to repeat it. Like uh, we study like multi-view representation, which I guess your question is still kind of gives us a hint of the 3D structure. Uh, whereas like you mean like just using 2D data for like just internet 2D data at all for these representation. Um, yeah, so I guess my, uh, my answer to this would be that we didn't travel. Uh, but it would be really interesting like to try generalizable NERF methods um, to learn these representations. So, I guess connecting my new 360 work, which is like the the second the the sixth uh, work that I fifth work that I presented, as well as the last work, uh, where in the new 360 we can learn these representation from just three views or maybe even one view, um, and we can then train good representation. But I would still say that NERF MAE still partly like hugely uh, is dependent on multi-view 2D data, which I would say the a very good extension is videos. So Ego 4D and all the other massive data sets out there. So videos are, I mean, in my opinion, I think videos are still very easy to capture. You can just roam around in the world, which I would say is still uh, a slightly easier medium than 3D, like having 3D artists create the world. So I guess that's my argument in the favor of that. Um, and for sure, I think there definitely exists a need for um, something like just using a single RGB or, you know, just high uh, unlabeled 2D data from the internet as well. Yeah, I think disentanglement prior can really help us there. So I, I, I really believe that uh, priors can help us in a lot of these cases. So we can have object models for people or like, you know, cars or maybe like traffic signs, which are really like, you know, just statics uh, or like maybe even in, in some cases dynamic. We can make use of some of these object priors, like learn these object priors beforehand and have like sort of two different branches in these sort of networks. So Neo360, we only have a single branch, but we can somehow uh, add like two different branches, one for objects, one for backgrounds. And so we can kind of move all of these different objects. And uh, there is actually a lot of work that exists in this space. Um, and and yeah, I mean, we, we are actually working in one of the areas like uh, that's the work is not out here. It's not part of this thesis, uh, but I can maybe uh, quickly explain it, but we're working on this like language-based sort of dynamic uh, kind of nerves. 
uh, which really allows us to model sort of you know different objects. Um, okay. I guess there is one more question from Amit who raised his hand. Hi, Zubair. Thanks. Uh, it's a really awesome talk. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I just had a question about like the implicit representation choice. Um, so you, you spoke a lot about, I guess, uh, a lot about like using nerves for tasks like 3D object detection and uh, semantic segmentation in 3D. Um, do you think like this newer class of representations like the Gaussian splats, um, again, it's more philosophical, but it, it would, would those kinds of represented, uh, would those kinds of representation also support your like overall kind of architecture? Because because uh, I assume like the whole framework is independent of the choice of representation itself, which makes it like more appealing. So um, just wondering what your thoughts is on that. Yeah, uh, the question was like, is the representation that we learned in NERF ME uh, invariant to the choice of NERF that we used? Um, and I think uh, we can replace all of the representations like it's either nerve and actually one of the things that we actually show in this paper is that the scenes uh, we use for scamnet is dense depth prior nerves. So it's a completely different nerve. Whereas the scenes we train for front 3D and hypersim is a classical instant NGP nerve. So we kind of still married both of these representation in one or architecture. And I don't see any uh, reason why we can't use Gaussian splatting or any other representation since it's, it's just a matter of uh, extracting sort of an uh, explicit representation from an implicit field. Um, and so we can do the exact same thing